I'm going to continue. Hi, this is Christine Donelsky. We're uh, recording today the Film and Literary Text Panel for the ALA 2021 um, conference, and we hope you enjoy these papers. Today we have three presenters, and I'll briefly introduce all of them now, and then they will give their talks, each um, about 20 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A um, session at the end um, with whomever's here. Um, our first presenter, um, is um, Zhang Zhu Xin, and she is a PhD candidate in the Department of English and Comparative Literary Studies at the University of Warwick. And she joins us from Seoul, South Korea. I'm very happy to have here, her here today. Her areas of interest include um, critical race and ethnic studies, gender and sexuality studies, nationalism, diaspora and global citizenship, food studies, dynamics and impacts of globalization and neoliberalism. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Um, her forthcoming PhD thesis focuses on racial gendering or gendered racialization of Asian American masculinity reflected in contemporary and Anglophone literary and cultural texts through the framework of racial hegemony and abjection. Now, Carolyn A. Brown is an associate professor of English, um, University of Montreal, Montreal, Canada. She specializes in 20th century US literature and culture, women's studies, and the literature of the African diaspora. Professor Brown is the author of The Black Female Body in American Literature and Art, Performing Identity, Rutledge 2012, which examines how African-American writers and visual artists inter interweave icon and inscription in order to re-envision the female uh, the black female body, traditionally rendered alien and inarticulate within Western discursive and visual systems. William Bartley, Associate Professor of English, University of Sask Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Canada, Department of English. His research and teaching interests include American literature of all periods, but with a special interest in 19th century writers. More recently, he's been studying film and television and their relationship to American literary traditions. He has more particular interest in the emergence of the so-called long form television as a dominant artistic form in its deep preoccupation with social change and how television itself is a particularly rich mode of ethical and philosophical uh, and political inquiry, excuse me, putting him as a result in the awkward but defensible position of arguing that we should all be watching more television, which we are these days, because what else is there to do still? All right. So um, we are going to begin um, with Ms. Shin. Um, oh, and let me just make sure that, um, yes, I am recording. OK, thank you. <laughs> that was my little panic, because God knows I've forgotten to do that with enough classes. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. Um, is there still sharing yeah. option available? Yeah, you or? should be able to go to the bottom of your screen. And if you scroll along with your cursors, found it. She's, in so, the, she's doing this the first time. so we, this is <laughs> Mm. If it's fine with everyone else, I will share my screen. Go ahead. And just read alongside the slides. So it is that okay for everyone? Yes, especially if you go to screen view. There we go. Get Right. So, children is a future, we often say. In the dystopian imaginations of the current apocalypse, one of our biggest culture fear is the loss of the child, the loss of the next generation, and the hope that will survive through the dystopian present into the future. Both The Mist, a novella by Stephen King, and its film adaptation, directed by Frank Darabont, and the host of film by Bong Joon-ho are in their most basic form stories of fathers who try to protect their children as they find themselves in an unexpected apocalypse. Those two narratives about fatherhood and the loss of the child 
are in conversation with one another, addressing the audience's cultural fears in their own, yet overlapping ways. With the framework of reproductive futurism, my presentation will compare the contrasting ends looking from deep despair and pessimism toward the hope for the future overcoming the loss of the past and our humanity's collective efforts to overcome our cultural fears through recreative imaginings of the future. And I promised in my proposal that I will discuss um, a variety of societal issues in those texts, but only if the time permits. So I'll just go alongside um, my presentation with focus on the reproductive futurism. And then if time allows, or if we have more time to discuss after the presentation, we'll talk about it. So this presentation is part of my rather simple efforts to understand why I like those fictions and movies I like, while sometimes some others don't. For these three te texts, the novella and the film, the mist and the movie, the host, make one coherent set of examples for one of the reasons. I'll talk you through my journey. Let me then begin with the plot of these three texts. Darabont's uh, film adaptation is faithful to King's original, except for the twist in its ending. While the change is significant, and I will focus on it later, the main plot is pretty much similar. So I will introduce a plot here for, for both, prior prioritizing the novella. So the mist begins with a severe thunderstorm that strikes a small rural American town and is followed by an unnatural mist. The day after the storm, the protagonist and narrator David Drayton, a su successful artist and a father of a five-year-old son, Billy, who's eight in the movie, set out to a local supermarket to get some food and supplies, leaving his wife, Stephanie, at home. Instead, his neighbor, Brent Norton, accompanies him. As they are at the supermarket, the store is besieged by a dense, unnatural mist. The plot revolves around people who are locked in the store as it turns out that the mist is hiding deadly, horrifying, otherworldly monsters that attack and kill people. David's among the first to encounter the monsters and to witness the death of the Norm, the bad boy. The survivors are split into several groups, and after some deaths, tensions rise among the survivors as they try to cope with the situation in their own ways. And as David tries to fight for himself, and more importantly, for Billy, he realizes that they not only have to survive against the monsters, but also the aggression from other survivors who begin to support Mrs. Carmody, a religious fanatic, for her claim for human sacrifice, which they actually do in the movie. Meanwhile, the host is a story of Park family trying to save Hyunsa, the youngest member of the family who is kidnapped by a monster that suddenly appears at Han River. She's in the closer there. The family runs a small sack bar in a park by the riverside where Hyunsa is taken by the monster. The father, Park Gangdu, I'm the first person in the poster is a slow-witted man, but he would do anything to save his daughter. The other members of the family joining the rescue missions are the grandfather and the aunt and the uncle. Before they even begin their search for Hyunsa, though, the family members are taken to be quarantined by South Korean government as they are considered dangerous due to their exposure to the monster and the potential virus that the creature, the host, is supposed to carry. On a side note, the story resonates so much with our current pandemic. So if you yeah. haven't seen the film yet, I really recommend it. Then, as Gangdu, the father, receives a phone call from Hyunsa, whom they believe to be dead, telling him that she is trapped alive in some sewer. The film narrates the family's fight to rescue Hyunsa. So how do these stories end then? Before we get there, I will call for your attention to both films' reception. But I will just go, go through quickly. So I will begin with the host, released from 2006 throughout 2007. 
The film received generally good reviews and critical acclaim. And the reviews are generally positive. So monster horror film combined fighting social and political commentary with blockbuster levels of action and horror. Or Bong Juno's incredibly incredible ability to balance serious drama and comedy. A horror, horror thriller, political satire, a dysfunctional family comedy, and a touching melodrama. One hell of a monster movie. Or a very cool horror movie. But this is a bit different in the case of The Mist. The film was first released in 2007 and made a good record and received generally positive reviews, but there's more ambivalence here. So some of the examples praise it as a must see for fans of Stephen King or what a horror film should be, dark, tense, and punctuated by just enough gore. And some phrases Frank Davent as the best thing that ever happened to Stephen King. But then some call it part cheesy creature feature, part moody apocalyptic thriller, or a guilty diversion. But as mentioned in the very last one, calling the ending to a film I can recall, uh, one of the most disturbing endings to a film I can recall in years, Many of them cannot leave out a commentary on the ending of the Darabont version of The Mist, which also had a strong impact on me as an audience. So they say the film manages to improve his on his source material by taking its bleak conclusion and expanding it to become what is possibly the best and most disturbing five minutes I've ever witnessed in a movie the bleak, bittersweet finale, or a particularly downbeat and realistic ending, truly disturbing, that goes beyond the King's original novella. The ending will haunt you for days. As most of the reviewers mentioned, the director and writer Darabont's choice to revise the ending has made it darker and more powerful, if devastating, than the original, change of which King approves. Obviously, they were questioned um, about the ending many times. And King explained that Darabont always told him that it needs a strong ending. And he said, Frank came up with an ending to the movie that I thought was terrific on the page. And King sent out this rather chilling message about the film's ending. Frank wrote a new ending that I loved. It is the most shocking ending ever, and there should be a law passed stating that anybody who reveals the last five minutes of this film should be hung from their neck until dead. So for those in the audience who had not seen the film, and also for my neck, I apologize in advance. This presentation is going to be a spoiler. I just hope this opportunity to consider the power of the ending compensates for disappointment of those who haven't read or seen the novella and films. Well, yes, some reviewers are disappointed by the film's ending. So one, for example, describes the film as itself a uh, B-movie. And the finale, a cruel Stephen King joke, is designed to convince us that we have been watching something more than Hawkeye, but I am unpersuaded. Or some just simply calls it such a disaster. So as you can see from the last year's comment, it doesn't even understand King's original. Um, I have to return to the question, why then the reviewer or the reviewer is so angry? Other than the reviewer being upset at Darabont Bond's focus on humans and monsters, he wouldn't be infuriated if the film's ending weren't so unforgivingly 
unforgivably bad. Darabont abruptly abandons his master's text in the movie's final minutes, sending Drayton and his little boy a plot twist that wouldn't be fair to reveal, but that is so distasteful and untrue to all that's come before it, as to be a slap in the face to characters and audience alike. So there's, I could find only one comment on the host ending in comparison. Internet Buzz states that Universal Studios is, of course, planning an American remake of the film. Considering how the original ends, it'll be interesting to see if any American director has the balls to be faithful to the finale. So to confirm your reasonable suspicions, yes, the kids die. But why the temperatures differ of the reviews of those two films and why are people upset by Darabont's ending, and not by Bones so much or King's? Is it just kids stuff? What can we find from the fates of the children and the fathers in those three texts? And why, if you feel the same as I do, do we like all three texts despite the grim narratives? Except, of course, for excellent writing, directing, and storytelling, etc. So, what becomes of these children's faith and the father's efforts to protect them into the future? But as for that future, we're confronted by Lee Edelman's proposal that we do and should have no future and no child, but as in a capital child. I'll explain here briefly. Edelman's discussion of reproductive futurism in no future, queer theory and the dead drive also begins with an image of a father. Edelman examines Bill Clinton's political ads, highlighting his fatherly figure as a supporter and a protector of children in particular. Edelman says, there's something more that helped him than his image of a daddy bear as the head of the political household. That is an image of the child whose innocence solicits our defense a value so unquestioned, because so obviously unquestionable that no one can refute. But simply, reprodu reproductive futurism is a belief in and desire for a future, which has as its emblem the child, the fantastic beneficiary of every political intervention. Edelman calls this political framework that feeds on the image of the child as an emblem of innocence and our future reproductive futurism. The terms of reproductive futurism impose an ideological limit on political discourse as such, preserving in the process the absolute privilege of heteronormativity by rendering unthinkable, by casting outside the political domain, the possibility of a queer resistance to its organizing principle of communal relations. This conservative ideology works to firm a structure to authenticate social order, which it then intends to transmit to the future in the form of its inner child. Edelman extends these reflections on public and political profiting from the figure of the child to reproductive futurism of gay rights activism and reproductive rights politics. But in this presentation, I will focus on the presence of reproductive futurism in these selection of texts that amplifies the persistence of such futurist ideas in our sometimes unsuspected popular cultural images. So Edelman presents as the imaginary figure of the child a heteronormative fixation, conservatism of the ego, a Ponzi scheme promoted, to, at, promoted at the expense of those who do not seem to serve its interests. One of Edelman's examples is a famous tiny team in Dickens's A Christmas Carol, and this little, little and critically ill boy who the ghost of Christmas yet to come shows Scrooge to be dead in the future. That is without financial aid to properly treat him. It's one of the visions that converts Scrooge the miser at the end of the story in his final revision of Scrooge's fate. Tiny Tim does not die as Scrooge supports him and becomes a second father to the child. The novella insists that we support the child for it is the only salvation for the better future. Why all this, though, in face of real children in danger in these texts? Penelope Deutsche explains that 
the vindications of no future are not anti-child, but anti-capital child. Edelman opposes the sentimentalized, sentimentalized images of future generation as continuing the hopes of the present and the vilification of those cast as impediments to the former. Rebecca Sheldon in The Child to Come explains this position of the child clearly that the child never more fully fulfills his function as emblem of reproduction than when his innocence is threatened and is open to protection and management. I propose to read the text within the framework of reproductive futurism. Both Billy and Hyunsa are exposed to threat from vicious monsters. Without fathers and the other adults help, they cannot survive. And the texts show that without them, there is no future for the fathers because they are the reason for the father's survival, the only hope. The rest of the obst obstacles to that realization of the father securing the future and their own identity, that is, are villains, monsters, literal and figurative. So now we are ready to meet the anticipated endings. David's group plans a final escape from the store. They are stopped by Mrs. Carmody, who again demands human sacrifice. And as she tells the crowd to get Billy and Amanda, a young woman who takes care of Billy, only the store manager, manager shoots Mrs. Carmody with a gun and they manage to escape. On their way to David's car in the parking lot, they lose more people and only David, Billy and other two or three in the movie make it to the car. David, after he takes a gun that Oli was carrying, who is now dead, slowly drives by the store into the mist. From here, after the escape, the final scenes of the novella and the film go different ways. So in the novella, the group heads towards David's house, but the roads are either blocked or damaged so David couldn't access the house. They go back on the road and on the radio, through the interference, David hears the word Hartford, which gives him hope of an escape from the mist. But the film does not end that way. So um, do we have enough time to see the clips or? You're at about um, eight, 18 minutes, a little before 18 minutes. You can have four more minutes. Oh, OK. Then I will show you. I'll bring you to 22 minutes or so. Uh, very briefly, the last scene. In the film, David goes to the house, finds the wife dead, and then they drive on. But they only encounter the monsters and the fuels running out. And they see nothing else alive but monsters. So the fuel runs out. And it's obvious in the faces of everyone that the end is near. While the last scenes show Billy's face, they it doesn't actually show David killing him. But still, this was David's choice. And for, for the time's sake, I'll just fast forward. 
David, without any bullets remaining, decided to kill himself by throwing himself to the monsters. But as he steps out of the car, he finds not the monsters, but a line of armies coming to rescue people. And as they drive past David, David falls down on his knees and the camera shows him scream for a very long time. But we'll stop here to, can I actually show the clip of the host's ending or is it too long? You know, um, we are at 5.30 now, so I think we should move ahead and then see how we're doing um, right. after the other two presentations, maybe. Okay. Sure. So if you could stop so, sharing your screen so the uh -huh. next person can share. Right. And we'll go on to Professor Brown's um, oh. presentation. Oh, okay. Um, yeah? Did you have more you wanted to say? Yes, actually a lot more, but... Um, it... I can give uh -huh. you two more minutes? To, to... Yes. All right. Sure. Thank you. So I will just talk you through the, um, the ending of the host. So the family goes, so the family finds um, Hyunsa's location and as they go and fight the monster, the father grabs Hyunsa out of its mouth, but the child is dead and clutching um, to a young boy who she's met in the monster's den. So with the help of the other families, the father manages to kill the monster. And as they mourn for Hyunsa, the father goes to the boy and wakes him up. And the last scene of the movie shows that Gangdu has taken the boy with him. And the movie finishes as they are eating together and ignoring a news broadcast about the aftermath of the incident with the monster. So right alongside Edelman's critique of reproductive futurism, I suggest that it is easier to understand why and why we, or at least I like all three endings for different but same reasons. Edelman's disclose, Edelman discloses the pervasive invocation of the child as the emblem of futurity's unquestioned value the defensive structure of the ego, the rigidity of identity as experienced by the subject, and the fixity of the imaginary relation through which we reproduce ourselves. The conservatism of the ego compels the subject, whether liberal or conservative politically, to endorse as the meaning of politics itself the reproductive futurism that perpetuates as reality a fantasy frame intended to secure the survival of the social in the imaginary form of the child. So. Thank, thank you very much, is that it? Um, no, actually, I was just gonna skip a few paragraphs and go to the ending. Is that okay? All right. Right, thank you. So, um, Sheldon suggests that the figure of the child stands in for a futurity that strips the future of everything but repetition, and yet insists that repetition is progress, no future indeed. But we, or at least I, find comfort in this repetition of the ending of the host and despair at the end of the repetitive cycle in the film version of The Mist. 
This is precisely why we are compelled by, if not happy with, the endings of the three texts, successfully narrating the story of devoted fathers and their figures against evil forces to protect their innocent children. The text's ending, while betraying the expectations of the reader audience of a happy ending, each gives us a confirmation of the logic of reproductive futurism. So I have textual analysis of both and uh, all of the endings, but I will just um, stop here for the next presenter. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. All right, Professor Brown. Um, thank you, Christine, for organizing this and um, for continuing with it despite the difficulties of COVID and um, the uncertainties of our you know, current age. But um, this is you know, a real pleasure to be able to finally meet everybody after all of this time I've been seeing these names floating through cyberspace. Um, so I'll, my, the title of my talk is From Page to Stage and Screen, Okwi Okpokwasili's Bronx Gothic and the Revision of Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. Um, in Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, Nicola Breedlove, a dark-skinned Black girl, yearns for blue eyes. As Morrison writes in the foreword to her reissue of the 1970 novel, The Bluest Eye was my effort to say something about why Nicola prayed for so radical an alteration. Implicit in her desire was racial self-loathing, and 20 years later, I was still wondering about how one learns that. Who told her? Who made her feel that it was better to be a freak than what she was? Who had looked at her and found her so wanting, so small a weight on the beauty scale? The novel pecks away at the gaze that condemned her. Set in Lorain, Ohio during the Depression, The Bluest Eyes largely narrated from the perspective of the feisty Claudia McTeer, her primary school friend who becomes witness to the tragedy of Nicola's life, her racialized, the racialized contempt inflecting the words and behavior of peers and adults alike, her rape by her alcoholic father that results in her pregnancy and miscarriage, her ultimate psychosis and social ostracism. Fundamental to the construction of the novel is how the gaze functions, how it reads, perceives, watches, ignores, dismisses, particularly onerous for black girls and women whose racial status largely precluded them from the privilege bestowed by ideals of beauty. In her foreword, however, Morrison admits her skepticism about her ultimate success. One problem was the centering of the weight of the novel's inquiry on so delicate and vulnerable a character could smash her and lead readers into the comfort of pitying her rather than into the interrogation of themselves for the smashing. My solution, break the narrative into parts that had to be reassembled by the reader, seemed to me a good idea, the execution of which does not satisfy me now. Besides, it didn't work. Many readers remain touched, but not moved. In my talk today, I explore how Okwi Okpokwasili's Bronx Gothic, or more accurately, Andrew Rossi's 2017 documentary on her eponymous one-woman play, can be read as the reconfiguration of Morrison's novel, particularly in parsing out Morrison's distinction between touched versus moved. Reflecting on the paradox of the representation of the Black body, Okpokwasili, a Nigerian-American writer, choreographer, performer, and activist, who was a 2018 recipient of the MacArthur Award, states in the documentary that, quote, the history of brown bodies in the United States is one in which the pain of brown black people was always on display. The owning of flesh, the ability to mark the flesh, the branding of flesh, the whippings and the lynchings, the hosings, now what we're seeing with brown bodies that are shot by police officers? Somehow we have been acculturated to watching these brown bodies in pain. Is that body so meaningless? Does that body have so little value? 
This is like an ontological crisis. Do I even exist if that existence can be erased without any kind of acknowledgement? I'm asking you to see the brown body, to see me specifically, and hopefully there is a flood of feeling for a brown body in pain." Unquote. As conceptualized by Okpo Kwasili, as with Morrison, the body in question has traditionally been contextualized within a racialized hierarchy, a dichotomy that relies not only on the public display of Black suffering and death, but its erasure through forms of discursive assault. Okpo Kwasili's configuration reiterates Christina Sharp's evocation of the weight in that both theorists capture the insidiousness of the epistemic, economic, material violence of global capitalism, in which Black diasporic lives are lived and all too frequently subject to premature death. Sharp specifically imagines the wake as slavery's afterlife, which trails the slave ship and middle passage, bringing death and devastation, as well as the multiplicity of diaspora, she relies on the terms metaphorical fluidity, natural man-made disaster, or death and memorialization, or coming into consciousness to mark white supremacy and to trace the development of forms of racial consciousness that, quote, resist, rupture, and disrupt, unquote, its ontological grip. Bronx Gothic the play unspools as adult recollection, here an unnamed adult performed by Okpo Kwasili, who reads childhood letters between her and an adolescent friend. And I want to warn that some of the language is somewhat rough and risque. I want to share something with you, she offers, words both ta that both taunt and, te and tempt. It is a note passed between two girls at the tender age of 11. From one girl's innocent question of, what is an orgasm, comes the friend's reply, like waves and waves inside of you, kind of like a day at the beach. Waves look like how orgasms feel. Two wildly distinctive characters, one helium-voiced and credulous, the other curt and worldly, converse in an epistolary exchange that, after elic eli initially eliciting nervous laughter from the audience, ultimately becomes a harrowing tutorial in emotional grievance and interpersonal violence. What begins as instruction and explodes into abuse. Dear you, because I'm not going to say your name. You're such a wrong bitch. You're the blackest, dirtiest, ugliest, smelliest from the shittiest dirt on the street that I know. And if you want to fight me, I'll be ready for you. Even the munificence of her contrition becomes the expression of contempt. I'm sorry that you ugly. I mean, you know you ugly. You can't let that make you sad. Everybody can't be pretty. It's hard to be pretty. While her words are an assertion of lighter skin privilege, which she relies on to disparage her darker friend, her abuse, though appalling, is not simply colorism. Just as her sexual precocity is not simply juvenile delinquency, but rather the weaponization of her trauma. The 11 year old narrator is a child emotionally groomed then sexually assaulted by her mother's boyfriend who is supposed to be her babysitter. The letter she exchanges with her friend both serve as its documentation and a form of exorcism where her grief negotiated and renegotiated haunts her. This scrambled emotional landscape becomes the maze that the audience of Bronx Gothic must navigate forced then to distinguish the practice of witnessing from the act of voyeurism. From the moment spectators enter the auditorium and search for their seats, they are made to behold Okpokwasili's dance, spasmodic and tortured, devoid of any context, for the first 30 minutes of the play. Not only must audience members locate their seats amidst the performer's riot of movement, they have to do so while struggling against their own sense of drift perhaps even resentment, particularly in, resent in relation to a largely nebulous plot. The audience then has to pay attention to the gestures and movements as well as the words of the character who might spontaneously tremble, jerk, or sway, or break into song, radiation and broken glass, 
I am like those broken waves, her voice a grief-filled wail, or rousing herself from her nightmares as instructed by her friend, she will affirm, you're awake. Alternatively, she might whisper in her more vulnerable moments, a tentative, am I awake? Bronx Gothic can be perceived as a theorization of the wake, which symbolizes the watery expanses of the unconscious and becomes the ultimate manifestation of, the, of its protagonist trauma. Nevertheless, if the two girls at its center are almost generic, lacking any consistent markers, racial or cultural, of identity or individuality, the anonymous girls are contoured by the universality implied by their namelessness. They can be any girl in almost any time or place. With this said, however, the light motif of waking takes on deeper meaning in that the imperative to wake up, a through line throughout the play, informs both the protagonist's narrative trajectory and the playwright's relationship with her audience. While the play is about the heroine's process of waking up or coming into consciousness, it depends on audience interaction and forms of recognition. If implicit in the theatrical production, in the documentary it becomes explicit within the context of the conversations taking place, exchanges with family, dialogues with audience members, largely female-centered rap sessions, and the director's interviews with interlocutors, including Okpuk Vasili herself. For instance, she states that the idea for the play first developed when she was pregnant with her daughter, and she considered the implications of the refusal to teach girls about their own bodies and sexual development. I started to think about how am I gonna make a performance that can guide my daughter through this culture where women's bodies are contested. I want her to have knowledge. And the thing about this piece is that the girls have knowledge. This question of knowledge certainly underscores the play's connection to Toni Morrison's novel, with which it creates a dialectic of sorts. Particularly in Piccola Breedlove's psychological deterioration after her rape by her father and increasing social isolation. The novel is, in effect, Claudia McTeer's reconstruction of her childhood, community, and friendship with Pacola as her own rite of passage into adult status and racial injustice. Bronx Gothic eliminates the character of the interlocutor. Instead, when the protagonist ultimately decided to go in search of her long lost comrade, despite the bitter dissolution of their friendship years before, Members of the audience may have already been able to identify vestiges of Piccola's own conversations with her imaginary friend in the often combative relationship of the two girls at the core of the play. And this is not between Piccola and Claudia, but Piccola and herself. Unlike Piccola, lost in denial as manifested in her imagination, imagined acquisition of blue eyes, what the heroine of Bronx Gothic discovers upon her return, return to her friend's home is her own childhood apartment. There is no cushion of sentimentality allowed through the presence of Claudia, whom I believe Morrison would, su would suggest guides and symbolically protects the reader. Rather, Okpokwasili's narrator wakes to the shock of self-recognition in the funhouse mirror of her splintered mind. Hurled back into the trauma of her childhood, she, like the audience, can no longer be a passive spectator. She must claim her pain. I'm here. I know this building. I, I look at the ground, spots of blood. I think somebody's bleeding to death in this building. Oh, my God. And I see her. I see the little girl bleeding in the middle of the living room. And I'm looking at her still as stone because it's like, looking in a mirror, I'm looking in a mirror and I'm so ashamed that I want to come it. The blood on the floor, she comprehends, is what remains of her miscarried fetus. Her character with the audience comes to understand that she has been in a dissociative state where she has divorced herself from the intractability of her pain. Her nightmares the message from her subconscious mind that she was unprepared to process. Or as Okpokwasili states, at the end of the piece, the narrator's fragmenting under the weight of something that's happened to her that hasn't been reconciled in her life. 
Although Okposili relies on her heroine's assertion of hardness to dramatize her performance, she does so by reading it not only through the wake as the entry into a state of greater social awareness or as an intertext with the bluest eye, but through the Gothic, destabilizing the latter's specific forms of enchantment in favor of its true horror, its roots in the mundane and commonplace. The Gothic relies on specific narrative conventions as delineated by Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, including sleep-like and death-like state, subterranean spaces and live burial, doubles, unnatural echoes or silences, unintelligible writings, and the unspeakable poisonous effects of guilt and shame. Most crucial, however, is the presence of the virginal heroine and a tyrannical older man with the piercing glance who is going to imprison and try to rape or murder her. Okpokwasili thus uncovers the reliance of the trope on the eroticization of sexual violence. In presenting her play exclusively from the perspective of the traumatized child, she upends the expectations of the genre, forcing the audience to, con to consciously bear moral witness to the cost of sexual abuse on the consciousness of its survivor. Refusing to represent the Gothic through either a conventionally masculinist gaze or a misogynistic desire, whether the compromised vantage point of the adult seducer or the chivalrous hero who enters the fray and saves the damsel in distress, the play does not hedge on the titillation of the loss of a fetishized sexual innocence, but on the grief resulting from the violence of its theft. Concurrent meanings can thus be identified in the protagonist's narration of her recurring nightmare of walking on the beach. If the water functions as a metonym for her subconscious, as the ocean boils and bleeds, so does her body, which explodes in movement and song, roiling with the intensity of suppressed emotions. Or, as Bokpokwasili has theorized in a separate interview with the journalist Soledad O'Brien, how do you reconcile that kind of wound with the attempt to form a self that isn't informed by the quake pain? You have to make another consciousness, another person, but there's still a bridge back to this wound. That tremor is still going to return. Like Piccola, who dissociates to protect herself from the emotional vulnerability caused by her internalization of her assumed ugliness, and the stigma caused by her rape and social liminality. The heroine of Bronx Gothic creates her alter ego to defend herself from the horror of her abuse, her sexual assault, her pregnancy and miscarriage, the pain of her emotional betrayal by a trusted adult. The imaginary friend, her shadowy double, fears the weight of the narrator's guilt and shame, forced then to tote the added burden of her internalized scorn. Though, Unlike in Morrison's novel, the audience is never informed about which girl is the victimized, which girl conjured. Most consequentially, perhaps, whenever the child turned adult, what is required of the audience is not only empathy, but a moral witnessing, or as expressed by Coco Fusco. Performance has historically been and continues to be about the unconscious, both individual and collective. It is about how meanings are generated in the moment out of interactions between individuals and between cultures. It is as much concerned with what we can control about our identities as what we cannot. This territory of multiple perceptions and of the unpredictable is a perfect place from which to continue to test the limits of the promise of democracy and tolerance. Great ideas to which this country aspires, but which it has such tremendous difficulties actually living up to. And Coco Fusco is a Cuban-American theorist and performance artist. Okpokwasili's strategy, so reliant on forms of shock and confrontation, reject a passive watching followed by a polite disengagement. Bronx Gothic, as play and documentary, forces these questions away from the realm of the characters and towards the response of the audience away from the good intentions of sentiment alone and towards potential action.
For Okpokwasili, this begins with the Black body, including its deep history and contemporary representation. As she rhetorically demands of the audience, there's a feeling of, is my Blackness getting on you? Am I getting on you? Can you take in not just the cool parts of Blackness, but can you take on the pain? Fundamental to this is a politics built on the capacity to care for the suffering of others, whether this specific character or a population excluded through tradition and expedience. For Okpo Kwasili, this is connected not only to the acquisition of knowledge, but to self-awareness itself. Or she cautions, I'm not just a brown body subject to your gaze. It's always clear that I'm watching you. Hopefully, in going back, I can make the gazer also think about how they might be being led. And hopefully, we'll be together growing our empathic capacity. Empathy here is articulated not only as the capacity to care, but a commitment to struggle, whether it's conversation, modeled in her dialogues with the audience, self-awareness, or as individual or collective action. In these troubled times, broaching deep divides and social fissures is both a facet of the demand for transformation and a precondition for its ultimate possibility. Notably, although the heroine of Bronx Gothic does gain knowledge of prior events and her resultant trauma, what she chooses to do with that knowledge is beyond the scope of our witness. The film demands the members of its audience to brace themselves in the face of what is all too often silenced and obscured in the, in the annals of the everyday Gothic. While the behavior of its protagonist is often shocking, unpleasant, and even infuriating, it serves as an SOS. I would argue that Okpo Kwasili wants her audience to be moved much more than touched. And in the intimacy of the moment, she returns the spectator's gaze with her own, which is both mirror and portal. In effect, she demands, what do you see? Where is your commitment? How will you bear witness? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. That, that was, um, I really appreciated being able to see that film. And, um, you know, if we, if time permits, um, we'll discuss this more. I'm going to ask um, William to um, go ahead and begin, uh, Professor Bartley, to begin his presentation now. Can everyone see that? Yes. Um, just, uh, just uh, there's an epigraph here. He writes novels like plays, set like plays, and shot like movies that air on television. This is Olivia Milch uh, of her father, David Milch, the uh, the showrunner and creator of uh, of uh, Deadwood. Um, the uh, uh, it is now widely assumed among showrunner, artists, journals, and academics that the long form serial television narrative has consolidated itself as a creative refashioning of and departure from traditional cinema, television, and literature, particularly the serial novel. However, this is a claim that must survive Jason Mattel's argument in Complex TV, The Poetics of Contemporary Storytelling. He rejects the view that the new kind of television is in fact a hybrid form, as argued by Brett Martin in Difficult Men. Instead, he affirms that it is a form peculiar to television itself and, its own unique pro and with its own unique properties, which are accordingly different in kind from the novel and cinema to which the new form would naturally invite comparison. I will contend, however, that the form resists this purification. It is so utterly bound up with and constituted by literary and cinematic tradition, it would simply cease to exist without reference to them. In the end, we shall see, despite Mattel's drive to define complex TV apart from any influence or analogical support, how tenaciously central the analogy to the novel is to the very conception of both the cinematic and long form television narrative. Tell defines his key notion of narrative complexity um, or, or complex TV in terms that echo Brett Martin's description of the new form. 
he, he defines it as a precise blend and adjustment of episode and series. Each episode a brick with its own solid satisfying shape. When Mattel says that complex TV at its most basic level redefines episodic forms under the influence of serial narration, not necessarily a complete merger of episodic and serial forms, but a shifting balance across a range of genres. The new TV surely does redefine episodic forms under the influence of serial narration. But then he goes on to declare that although contemporary complex serials are often praised as being novelistic in form and scope, he has that such cross media comparisons obscure rather than reveal the specificities of television story storytelling form. And what goes for the novel also goes for cinema. It's a small step to separate television from both film and the novel, or rather literature. Complex TV belongs to television alone. Television, television's narrative complexity, Mattel says, is predicated on specific aspects of storytelling which seem uniquely suited to the television series structure apart from film and literature, and that distinguish it from conventional modes of episode and episodic and serial, serial forms. The foundation for this judgment emerges as he argues more specifically against looking towards film as a model of storytelling for television. Although he concedes that certainly cinema influences many aspects of television, especially concerning visual style, he is nevertheless, quote, reluctant to map a model of storytelling tied to self-contained featured films under the ongoing long form narrative structure of serial television, where continuity and seriality are core features. And thus, I believe we can more productively develop a vocabulary for television on its own medium terms. Now, with a discussion that rejects definition by way of analogy, that is by comparison long form narrative to other forms, notably film and the novel, in order to expose similarities in spite of differences, in favor of a definition by category, that is defining long form narrative in terms of its differences from other forms in spite of similarities. It can't fail to be an echo of George Bluestone's warnings about seeing analogies between novels and films. Once again, drawing upon and extending Lessing's attempt to break up the ancient analogy between poetry and painting, Bluestone spins this into the view that film and novel should remain separate institutions, each achieving its best results by exploring unique and specific properties. This follows from his bifurcation of their respective functions and properties into two incommensurate streams. He designates the novel as conceptual, linguistic, discursive, symbolic, and inspiring mental imagery with time as its formative principle. And film is perceptual, visual, pres presentational, given to visual images with space as its formative principle. There's no doubt that perceptual, in quotes, in scare quotes, is not only different, but subordinate to conceptual. And in saying so, he reveals the ca that cast of mind that sees only the sharpest distinction between rational, that is the conceptual, and irrational or emotive proper to the perceptual and privileges the former over the latter. It's the same cast of mind that distrust analogy itself is lacking philosophical and scientific rigor in favor of categorical forms of definition. One must be skeptical of the soft impression, impressionistic comparisons that define poetry and painting, novel and moving image, over, novel and moving image overtly compatible and zero in on the secretly hostile essentials in both pairs. Mattel, unlike Bluestone, who is, who is an analogical and thus an ironic hop, skip, and jump from Lessing, is not primarily interested in separating the novel from the film, and he has little to say about the old debate, perhaps because he believes that it is already settled. He's almost exclusively attentive to narrative structure, but he is as intensely determined to protect the integrity of complex TV from analogical entanglements with both the novel and the cinema as Bluestone is to protect the novel from the entanglement with the cinema. If Bluestone argues that a comparative study which begins by finding resemblances between the novel and film ends by loudly proclaiming their differences, he would also likely argue that finding resemblances between the novel and long-form television, or between cinema and long-form television, would lead one to loudly proclaim their differences as well. If Bluestone balks at the obstacles that divide word from image, poetry from picture, and by analogy, novel from film, it seems a small if an analogical adjustment to claim that the narrative structure of a long-form television is unique to television and, and owes nothing to, and is so categorically, categorically distinct from the novel. I think part of my point there is that it's difficult to argue without using analogy. But as attractive as these claims will likely prove to be, the argument that TV 
uh, complex TV is a unique self-contained form that owes nothing to cross-medium comparisons that is, is again incompatible with other media, it depends on a nest of false distinctions that undercut, that undercut the, uh, uh, the categorical distinction Mattel tries to maintain and it pushes us back towards an analogical relationship. We are pushed that is away from differences towards similarities. First of all, Mattel attempts to disconnect television from film by distinguishing, distinguishing between self-contained feature films and ongoing long form. But all forms by definition, because they are forms, are fundamentally self-contained. Inasmuch as they have definition, their formal principles decree a beginning, middle, and end. The distinction obscures the fact that the differences between the self-contained and the ongoing long form, however messy and ungainly, is not starkly absolute as, is, as the difference between, say, finite and infinite, or open and closed, or living and dead, Although I'm reminded of Billy Crystal in uh, The Princess Bride, who distinguishes between uh, dead and mostly dead. So there's not, perhaps there's no polarity there. Um, anyway, um, a two hour feature film is more obviously self contained than a 70 hour long serial, which, ongoing as it is, when it is ongoing, does come to an end. Even a series like Barry Levinson's indefinitely ongoing reality murder investigation, The Killing Fields, which take us, takes us to the very limit of what ongoing open-ended narrative form could be, has a formal coherence because of a built-in expectation of closure in spite of its indefinite deferral. The murder might be solved, the case abandoned, the show canceled, whichever. To be sure, continuity and seriality are core features of long-form television narratives, but they are core features of conventional cinema too. And indeed, any narrative, if we aren't to do damage to the notions of serial, seriality, or episode, or narrative as a whole. And so these are some of the images, these are some of the definitions that we're dealing with here. But just to be sure, we remember that an episode is a developed situation that is in, integral to, but separable from a continuous narrative, and holds its shape without regard. It would seem to be the duration of a narrative, although it is a, it has a, specific application in the current context of series in multiple forms of media. That is to say, an episode is each of the installments, is each of the installments into which a film, television, or radio drama is divided for transmitting as a series. It is worth remembering that a series and its derivation as the adjective serial in the current context is very specifically with respect to the serial novel, a set of literary compositions having certain features in common published successfully or intended to be read in sequence in later use also the succession of books of any kind issued by a publisher in a common format and having some similarity of subject or purpose, usually under an overall title. And with respect to radio, television, and internet program, programming, a set of radio or television programs broadcast in sequence, usually in regular episodes, and typically having a single theme or a continuous storyline. In this light, Mitchell is not asking us to consider a new definition of either episode or serial, series or serial. What he's asking us to do is to forget the more general definition of series, which covers these more specific senses and which includes the conventional self-contained feature films, and for that matter, novels. Any number of discrete things of one kind, especially events or actions following one another in succession over time, or in order of appearance or presentation. More simply put, a television serial and a feature film are both constituted by a relationship between part and whole, between parts as the equivalent of episodes, where chapters that se se sequentially placed in series fill out and define a thematic narrative whole. Any film can be broken up into equivalents of episodes, of parts, that sequentially fill out into a sense of seriality. One can select a Hollywood film almost at random, uh, which is true in this case. I did select this at random. Preston Sturgis is the great McGinty, for example, and note how readily it can be described as a serial progression of chapter or episode equivalents, 17 in all, in fact, and how each episode chapter is built out of three or four scenes. DVD menus are often extend, often extend the analogy between the novel and the film and follow suit with marked chapter divisions with, that accord with actual structural divisions. The point, and Mattel can't help making it himself, is that long form television narrative does not have an exclusive claim on the core features of continuity and seriality. It simply, as Mattel unguardedly says, redefines, emphasis mind, 
episodic forms under the influence of serial narration. He thus has to concede that a relationship between episode and serial narration is still at the core, and that they are differently, different only because their relationship is modified, rebalanced, and hence redefined. The difference is generated by the simple fact that, again, the long form is longer. But again, the difference between long form television narrative and cinema and earlier forms of television is a difference of degree, not of kind. Its structural parts accordingly relax and exhale into greater flexibility and, and capacity. Similarly, if, if apparently open form is, is, is implicitly self-contained, the apparently self-contained form is in the same proportion, implicitly open in the sense that even the most clearly defined and closed narratives invite speculation about possible ways of continuing a story that will continue to res resonate with how the story does in fact end. Perhaps then it will come as no surprise apart from these conceptual issues, or perhaps even because of them, that when Mattel does get down to describing the specificities of television storytelling form that comparisons with novel and film would obscure, he runs into trouble. These descriptions of these specificities are parasitic on the models of literary traditions and literary, on the models and literary traditions he would reject as relevant since he is describing an unprecedented form. When he takes up his evaluation of The Wire and Breaking Bad, he prefaces matters by reminding us that he aims to, quote, to evaluate them both on their own medium terms. They are television programs, not novels or films adapted to the small screen. And thus we can look to their successes as as aspects of a distinctive television aesthetic. The Wire is an example of a particular mode of narrative complexity that he calls centrifugal complexity. Um, Uh, which he describes as follows. The, un the ongoing narrative pushes outward, spreading characters across an expanding story world. On a centrifugal program, there is no single narrative center as the, as the action traces what happens between characters and institutions as they spread outward. It is not just that the series expands in quantity of characters and settings, but, he's, but that its richness is found in the complex web of interconnectivity forged across the social system. One can't be blamed for thinking that all Mattel has done here is to blindly stumble upon the, the structure of the Victorian novel. Ian Duncan offers Sir Walter Scott's The Heart of Midlothian as the prototype. He combines different narratives into an expansive, complex, and variegated structure that projects schemes of analogy and metaphor across drastic mutations and discontinuities of form and theme. This narrative structure amplified in the great multi-plot novel of Dickens, Thackeray, Trollope, and Eliot is able to articulate the, the relations among a bewildering diversity of classes, cultures, regions, epochs. David Simon said as much. But only by failing to recognize the historical origins, its historical origins, can Mattel claim it as a medium-specific category. Indeed, Mattel is, Mattel is forced to ignore or downplay a writer's typical urge to enrich and enlarge the thematic context of the story as Mattel himself struggles, struggles to maintain a rather severe discipline necessary to cut off comparisons of complex TV to the film or the novel. The consequences of, of, of his success here are quite damaging. On rare occasions, there is leakage. For example, in the next sentence after the last one quoted, he sees an intertextual connection. Systemic logic, quote, systemic logic trumps characters' actions or motivations as when Snoop, quoting Clint Eastwood in Unforgiven, answers the question of what an executed victim did to deserve his fate. She justifies an unjustifiable murder by saying, deserves got nothing to do with it, end of quote. Now Mattel's intertext intertextual alertness opens the door to a range of interpretive opportunities that his own assumptions prevent him from following up on. Any such interpretive follow through would have led him to a consideration of the film and literary genres that cluster together to shape the action of the series. Having landed on Clint Eastwood's most important Western film, he might have explored the truly potent generic connections between The Wire and the Dirty Harry films and the emergence of the so-called urban Western. But he can't and won't go through the, the door himself. As a result, Mattel's readings have a certain flatness. They simply do not resonate with literary and cinematic traditions and with a host of intertexts that he deliberately excludes. He is cut off from a community response that shares these traditions and texts. A similar kind of call comes from when, in another context, which he describes the visual palette of Breaking Bad, Mattel speaks abruptly of the stylized landscape shots evoking Sergio Leone's westerns. But which film or films by Leone? 
wouldn't it be worth following up on, even by way of dismissal, the role that the Western genre might play in the conception of Breaking Bad? Is there perhaps an unexpected congruence with, with The Wire, especially since both series dramatize severe challenges to the viability and sanctity of the rule of law? And since Snoop has already alerted us to the possible connection, and following this, one remembers the gunfighter standoff, the gunfighter standoff scene between Omar and Brother Muzon in the opening episode of the third season. And so connections with the Western film begin to, to gather and to ramify. There are other doors Mattel tries with equivalent strain to keep tightly shut as he is forced to forego the, with, with any reference to literary cinematic traditions and genres and interpretive situations which insist on their relevance. Uh, accordingly, he's blind and deaf to David Simon's clear and explicit ev evocation of Greek tragedy. Uh, I, I'm going to cut, I'm going to leave that section out for, for the sake of time. But uh, it, uh, it just, it, it harps on the same point. Um, I think it's time to conclude. In conclusion, Olivia Mills' observation of her father at work belongs as an epigraph because it is, it is a reminder of one of the difficult men in Brett Martin's phrase who began the process of improvising a new artistic form in the brute and desperate world of network television. He, like other pioneers of the form, demonstrated creativity is not the miracle of making something new out of nothing, but of making something new out of the already given. In spite of Mattel's best efforts, long form television survives as an inescapably hybrid form as it evolved in the actual practice of artists and writers, whose creative and, opportuni uh, creative and opportunistic departures from traditional forms have fashioned what John Doyle has described as the defining storytelling the storytelling medium of the 21st century. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you could um, stop sharing your screen, we can open it, um, open up, uh, uh, you know, uh, the and discuss. Um, so you just have to stop sharing. There you go. Thank you. Um, all right, it's 6.15. So we have about 20 minutes because we started uh, recording about five minutes late. Um, uh, are there any questions um, from our audience? Elsa or Holly, does either of you have a question? Or, sh um, or does, um, you can type into the chat if you wish to do so. And... Um, um, Hello. Hi, Holly. Hi there. Um, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. I really, really enjoyed it uh, uh, from around the world. Uh, I, I do have a question. Um, my uh, question uh, is for uh, uh, Professor Brown. And the thank you so much. Uh, so I, I have not seen the movie that you spoke of, but I have read The Bluest Eye effect twice. Um, and I, this, I was really, the, so you, you say, uh, Toni Morrison about that she didn't want, uh, her audience to have pity for Pecola. And that, I mean, I know that your whole, the thesis of being touched and not moved, but she says that she failed. So I, I just wanted to know, do you agree with that? Or if you could just elaborate that failure or, and, and personally, what, what, what do you think? You got to unmute yourself. Um, I think that's a pertinent question. That's a very important question. I, I actually don't agree with her. I, um, the Bluest Eye is her first novel and the first novel by Morrison that I remember reading in, in its entirety. And I was profoundly moved by it on any number of levels. And I understand what her critique is, which is that it's easy to um, fall into sentimentality and not, I, I think it's similar to Richard Wright's critique of his Uncle Tom's children, um, that banker's daughters could read it and cry. And he wanted to create a novel in um, Native Son where you couldn't fall back into that. So I think it's related to that. Um, however, I think The Bluest Eye is incredibly powerful I think she's doing a lot with the novel. I think that experimentally, um, whether you call it, you know, an extension of the modernist tradition or postmodernist, especially when she takes the text, 
the primer and this is the ball, this is, um, this is uh, the house, there's the girl. And she basically unscrambles it. So by the end, um, you see from the perspective of the child who is traumatized, who is alienated, what reading that book means. And I think it's as, as powerful as um, Okpokwasili's play in terms of completely throwing the spectator, the reader, into a completely different way to engage with a narrative um, and to show how alienating that narrative can be. Um, so I think on any number of levels, Morrison is very successful. But with that said, I understand her critique. And I think part of it is that, she, especially when you read um, not only some of her later novels, but a lot of her essays, she has this kind of way of analyzing um, with a complete lack of sentimentality, whatever she is engaged in. And you see this in many of her essays, but I think immediately of playing in the dark, where she's looking at um, very often white canonical literature and looking at the Africanist presence in that, and basically parsing it out one step at a time, and so that you completely understand what that tradition is about, where it's coming from, um, how it benefits certain people at the same time as it hides its own intentions. And with The Blue Sky, I think what she's saying is that you can kind of say, oh, poor Pecola, what a hard life, and that's it. Um, but that depends on the reader. Another reader can come to it and, um, as I mentioned with the text, you kind of have an experience of reading the text from, an, from the position of an alienated child. And here in Canada, I'm thinking about, you know, their recent um, discovery of the graves of Indigenous children at a boarding school and the kind of reality of what that means in terms of these histories of um, intergenerational trauma. So she's dealing with that. But then you look at what she does with the parents and with each Charlie and Pauline, she gives their entire lives, their life stories in a matter of pages. So you really understand who these people are and how hard it is for them to love completely and freely with their own child, especially because they have internalized a lot of the notions and what she does, and, and Morrison does this from book to book, um, novel to novel, but it really starts in The Bluest Eye where she looks um, with a kind of clear eye vision of the dangers, not only of beauty, but of the media and what it means to sit quietly watching a movie and a movie that has nothing to do with you. So I don't completely agree with her. And, you know, for the longest time, that was probably um, my favorite novel by her. But with that said, I also understand the critique. And with that said, I don't think Okpok Wasili is any more successful, ironically enough, than Morrison in that attempt, because really you can't push a spectator any more than he or she where they are willing to go, so. Well, I just have a, a little follow-up there. Um, you know, having seen um, Bronx Gothic, it, it does seem though that she attracts an audience that is maybe willing to go further um, than just, you know, any random person. <laughs> That, that people come, I think, with an attitude, with an expectation to be moved instead of to be simply voyeurs. Um, because it seems to me that especially the young women watching this, because it, it went on tour to a lot of college campuses, recognized in some ways their own stories there as an abject girl of color, right? Um, and I think that's the other way it's really important, not simply to be didactic, but also to kind of raise up um, uh, pain um, that society too easily represses, a dominant society. And those are good points. And I agree with you in terms of the audience being willing to follow. But with that said, I mean, you look at The Bluest Eye, and if 
you had that audience reading The Bluest Eye, I think they'd have a similar response because there's an openness. Yeah. But you think about some of the audience members and one young woman says, oh gosh, my boyfriend sat down. He's like, oh no, kill me now. <laughs> to someone in the back speak about oh god what is going to happen here so it really depends i mean part of it is you have a captive audience of women <laughs> generally speaking to in terms of her um of her rap sessions who are really into it um but their partners or their friends or these other people who are involved might be invested but maybe less so yeah, and maybe yeah. somewhat differently Point well taken. Point and well you can think about her conversation with her husband where they're arguing about roots and her husband is a white American from Wisconsin. Yeah. And, and he's like, you know, the thing with black people, they have to keep coming back to the past and all those sad stories. They need to be able to move on. I mean, he's a collaborator. <laughs> He's her ally. And they have this fascinating discussion where she's like talking to him and he's like, okay, I get what you're saying, but still. Um, so you really see that even though they're all in this together in terms of their goals, they're coming from such different perspectives and vantage points. Yeah, yeah. Just one second here. There. Uh, Bernice, just turn off your microphone, please. We were picking up some background noise. Thank you. Um, um, well, what I see in common with um, both the texts that um, Jung and um, Professor Brown were working on is the abjectness of children and how they do become, you know, um, symbols of societies. Um, you know, there's this supposed to be this instinct to protect them and you know the, what happens when children are um, pr uh, unprotected and what does that mean you know can dads be dads if they don't protect their children but instead molest their children etc you know that's what we see um, in um, uh, in the the Morrison text but what we and children should be the hope of the future right but we do see the abjection of children in, in both texts mentioned. Ju, did you want to do, uh, discuss that at all? Oh. Yeah. Oh, should I go first? Yeah. All right. So yeah, um, I was more curious about the fates of the fathers than somehow um, in this movies or novella and then the fates of the children possibly because possibly also because I was um, studying masculinity but at the same time that the children didn't seem so close um I thought they were represented more as a symbol than anything in those texts at least um, it'll be different from um, different for um, the bluest eye, for example, because it's from the child's perspective. But then the novel written, novella written by the dad, or the film shot, pretty much following David Drayton, and also the host also shows. Well, the host I think tries a little bit differently to feature um, Hyunsa as a living child than the sim simple symbol of hope. But as I was discussing um, in the last part of my presentation, um, she also becomes a sort of a symbol by reliving or by being objected in one sense to the situation of the dead. At the same time, she is living inside the child who's taken by her father um, as a, well, it, it should be, I think it's fair to say as a replacement. And the fact that that gave me or the audience a part of satisfaction or comfort is, I think, um, a little bit problematic and 
I think that's what Edelman wants to problematize as well, the sort of symbolification, symbolization of the children rather than as actual real people. Yeah. If that makes sense. Simplifying it too much, maybe. You know, yeah, because the young girl, she doesn't, you know, she's she's really the one who survived so very long, and you kind of can't believe that she's not there at the end because you do want mm -hmm. that Steve Spielberg kind of ending where everybody survives, but the little girl does get sacrificed. Um, yeah. I don't know. I also thought it was interesting that in both cases, the U.S. government in some way or another, you know, cre created the these evil forces, <laughs> both in Korea and both in Stephen King's original novella. Um, so we ha there we have, you know, the ultimate paternalism um, of capitalism, which isn't so paternal at all, right, but only has its own militaristic kind of tendencies. Um, I don't know. So... Um, um, Bill, is there anything, um, you know, I thought your your reading was very interesting and it just made so much sense because um, when you first quoted that, um, f uh, the quote from the, 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 the book on um, Victorian novel in the 19th century, even before you got to Dickens, I was thinking, of course, that's what Dickens does, right? Right. Um, and I think if, you know, especially in this time of, um, you know, having long format and being able to have these complex plots with people from all levels of society and racial backgrounds. Um, I just think it is really interesting to see, um, uh, you know, how full these texts could be. And for me, I saw um, uh, Good Lord Bird and it just seeing the black community being so vital in that televised text um, next to John Brown's craziness and, and white saviorism. Um, you know, uh, I, I just thought that was fascinating, um, the way that text went. I don't think it's an accident that, uh, that so many long form television productions are historical, that, that, they're, that they're deeply preoccupied, deeply preoccupied by how things change, uh, uh, that, uh, that activism is in conflict with with conservatism, that the, the different social classes are in, in conflict with each other, that there's mobility between the two positions, uh, and 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 it and it ramifies into the into the larger culture. And and um, I think it, I think uh, Good Lord Bird is a good example of that. Um, I, I think uh, shows like. Uh, um, Deadwood and uh, and Boardwalk Empire and and even Mad Men um, uh, feast on that. Yeah, no, they're they're very um, and they're all to me they read as very very you know masculine text for the most part. There is is some attention paid to the women characters, especially well in. In uh, Mad Men in particular, you see um, some of the women characters gain uh, much more agency through time, um, but it's still such a masculine world, um, all these um, worlds in many of these texts. I think one thing, one thing that, that interests me about Mad Men and, 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 and even Deadwood um, is how that world is gradually breaking apart. And it, and it comes about through, um, uh, through, uh, sometimes unintended consequences. Uh, if you remember from Mad Men, Peggy is, Peggy becomes a copyright editor, but, she, but she's promoted by Dawn uh, despite, uh, despite uh, uh, Pete, who is, who's climbing up, uh, climbing up his ass uh, ambitious-wise. And, and so he puts Pete in his place by, by, by forcing Peggy on it. And, she, and, she, and that's why she gets promoted. It's not that she's without merit, but, uh, but that's, but that's, uh, that's, uh, that's social reality uh, colliding with, uh, with the forces of change. Now that's true. Women often become CEOs in situations when no man wants to take the job. Oh, right. <laughs> That's kind of had happened with, I guess, Chevrolet at one point, or, or you know, um, whatever, you know. Um, and I think that happens to minorities too often, 
you know. Um, uh, so there you go. But you, you, even though I, even though one senses the, the long form is dominant, uh, the, uh, the shows are tightening up. There are no longer there are fewer and fewer uh, long term multi season um, series. Uh, the John Brown series was what eight episodes, and that's it. I think it was seven actually. Maybe it was eight. But yeah, well, I think they were very true to novel because James McBride was one of the producers on it. And so I think they sort of went into it. And what do you do after John Brown's dead? You know? Right, exactly. <laughs> That's history for you. Um, you know, he's not going to be uh, resurrected. Um, but I haven't yeah. had a chance to see uh, the, uh, the Netflix um, series. Um, uh, help me out here. What is... Um, uh, the one about the um, Underground Railroad. Um, that's I think that's what it's called, the Underground Railroad. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's going to go for more than one season. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with that one. Well, a lot of stories to process. Yeah. Um, and I think that has a much more different structure too. It's not as tied to history. That's more creative and imaginative um, it, from its very premise. Seeing these. Um, uh, slavery in, in in these different contexts in these different states, um, uh, these stations on the railroad to get to freedom. Or at least that's what I've read, but that's all secondhand at this point. Well, we are at 6.35 and I'm figuring that's about um, 90 minutes. I'm supposed to give them 80, but I'm sure that um, everybody's uh, full talk will be there and um, I'll be sending it off to the MLA and they're supposed to have a um, YouTube website for all these virtual um, conferences. So you can advise uh, your colleagues and family and friends to look there for our discussions today. I wanna to thank the panelists so much for um, waiting out for 14 months um, to, to give their presentations and for the quality of their presentations and the thought that they went into them. And I really liked the panel because um, everybody was um, coming from different places um, to look at uh, very real issues related to um, literary text and film content. So I thank you for that. And thank you, Christine, for organizing this. All right. Thank you. Well, I'm going to stop recording now.